Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Ann Henderson, Director of Education and Outreach here. And on behalf of the Frist Center, I would like to thank the Metro National Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for their continued and ongoing support of our exhibitions and programs. I'd also like to thank our Looking East exhibition sponsors, HCA TriStar Healthcare, Christie's, and United States Japan Foundation. Tonight, we are very pleased to welcome Simon Kelly to the Frist Center for his lecture, Vincent van Gogh in Japan, that will explore the artist's fascination with Japan and the profound influence of Japanese on his work. I invite you to visit the exhibition following the lecture to see van Gogh's portrait of the postman, Joseph Roulon, one more time before the exhibition leaves on Sunday. Um, our galleries will remain open tonight until nine o'clock. Simon Kelly has been the curator of modern and contemporary art at the St. Louis Art Museum since September of 2010. He's worked previously at such museums as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. He received his BA from the University of Cambridge and his PhD from Oxford University where he also taught art history. Dr. Kelly has organized numerous exhibitions including Monet's Water Lilies in 2011, for which he wrote the accompanying exhibition catalog. He's also published extensively on 19th and early 20th century French art and has been published in various exhibition catalogs for museums such as the National Gallery of London as well as the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. for such exhibitions also as Manet, The Man Who Invented Modern Art, and Becoming Van Gogh, which was published in 2012. But he, this, his essay, which was A Big Good Enterprise, Van Gogh and His Markets, received uh, an award from the uh, American Art Museum curators for his essay. Simon is cur currently curating the exhibition Impressionist France, Visions of Nation from Le Gray to Monet, for which the St. Louis Art Museum had organized it with the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City and the accompanying catalog. He's also currently working on Degas and Millinery for an upcoming exhibition as well. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Like to, to work in, but anyway, it's great. It's great to be here, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Anne, for the introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, so I've been impressed by the exhibition uh, today. I've had a chance to to see the show. Trinita has done a great job, um, and it's great to see the uh, you know the mix of media uh, that uh, you know have been brought together uh, in this exhibition. I wonder if we can get this light actually to. Yeah, I don't know, it's just be good to... Oh, yeah, that's better. Well, actually, we'll make camera. Let's see. Oops. Oh, it's all right. I mean, it's, right. it's better now, so... I'll give you a flashlight. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, a painting that I think really embodies um, Van Gogh's attraction to Japan. Uh, this uh, painting, uh, self-portrait as Bonzo, was, was painted in... Uh, September 1888, when Van Gogh was in Arles, uh, when he recently shaved his head uh, to emulate the appearance of a Japanese Buddhist monk, um, or Bonza. Um, in a letter to Gauguin uh, at this time, he described himself as, quote, simply worshipping the eternal Buddha uh, in this portrait. While to his sister, uh, Will, he wrote that he represented himself um, as, quote, a Japanese. Um, you might also gather that, in, in a way, Van Gogh has almost kind of adapted his features to, to look more Japanese, if you, if you look at the way he's represented himself here. Um, but I think it's a good introduction to a talk which will uh, examine uh, Van Gogh's uh, close uh, identification with Japan uh, for much of his life. Now, Van Gogh never went to Japan, uh, but as we shall see, he, he read extensively about uh, the art of Japan uh, and the culture of the country, and he also built up uh, an extensive collection of Japanese prints. 
Um, it was interesting to read Trinita's introduction about Monet, so we can sort of go back and forth about who had more Japanese prints, Monet or Van Gogh, um, but uh, certainly Van Gogh had a, had a substantial collection. Um, and Van Gogh's embrace of Japan is a, a central element within his, his, broader, his broader career. And just a little context on, on Van Gogh here. He's perhaps best known as a kind of mythologized um, figure, the kind of archetypal, uh, tormented and neglected artist uh, who ultimately committed suicide at the age of only 37. He's generally thought uh, to have committed suicide despite the recent uh, book uh, that uh, suggests that he was shot by a group of young boys in Orvea, but the, the Van Gogh Museum is, 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 is sort of fiercely saying to the story that he did uh, commit suicide. This kind of image of, of Van Gogh as a misunderstood outsider is embodied by Kirk Douglas in, in uh, Vincenti Minnelli's uh, 1956 film, A Lust for Life. This is a poster for the film. And uh, I didn't know whether to include the next ones, but I did. Uh, and Van Gogh has, has become a kind of a iconic figure within popular culture. So, you know, here you can see a group of bobblehead, um, here we are, bobblehead figurines, <laughs> with uh, uh, Van Gogh uh, alongside other iconic figures of, of popular culture, Warhol, uh, Dali, and Picasso. I could have, I, I googled Warhol and toys, and uh, uh, Van Gogh and toys, rather, and there's a whole you know, series of, of images which I could have shown, um, but this is just one example. Um, the continuing interest in, in Van Gogh's work is also evident in the furore uh, that surrounded the recent discovery of a previously unknown painting uh, by the artist, Sunset at Montmajour. Um, here it's being presented to the press by the Van Gogh Museum director, uh, Axel Ruger. This is a painting from uh, 1888, from the Arles period, um, it was a strong painting, and uh, as I say, it's created a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. Um, although the, pre uh, the, the presentation of this work has been kind of satirized in the press, um, this is uh, in regard to, to this, um, uh, this image, and, and I guess Van Gogh's perceived inability to sell uh, any work in his lifetime. Um, so, uh, you know, it's often said that he only ever sold one painting in his career, but in, in fact, the reality was more complex. And I wrote about, that was the essay that Anne mentioned, when I, I sort of delved into uh, Van Gogh's career in terms of his, his markets and his, his um, you know, thinking about his, his art in terms of commodities. Um, and he actually sold not one painting, but four paintings um, in his career. And uh, he understood the workings of the art market actually really well. I mean, he, um, he spent several years as an art dealer in London, Paris, and Amsterdam in the 1870s. Um, one of the interesting things about Van Gogh is that he only turned to painting pretty late on in his career when he was 27. Um, so his, his output is limited to um, the last 10 years of his life between the ages, ages, age of 27 and 37. But within that 10-year period, he was incredibly prolific. He produced 900 paintings and around 1,000 drawings, as well as a voluminous body of correspondence uh, written in several languages, um, most notably uh, Dutch, uh, French, and English. He obviously was Dutch, fluent in, in Dutch, but also French and English. Um, you know, and if you get a chance, I do recommend you're looking at those letters. They're incredibly rich, and um, you really get a sense of Van Gogh as this uh, deeply, cultured, um, a deeply cultured man. Uh, so this talk is going to focus uh, on his relationship to uh, Japanese uh, culture. As we know, uh, Japan had opened up to the West in, in the mid-1850s, and there was a particularly uh, notable display of, of Japanese um, art at the 1867 World's Fair in Paris. Um, here I'm showing you a, 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 an image of uh, the 1867 uh, Japanese pavilion. Um, and then just a little bit of context, because the exhibition here does look at Impressionism looking east, um, but there were Barbizon school artists who were looking uh, east earlier. Um, probably the first artist to be influenced by a Japanese prince was uh, Tero Russo, um, the Barbizon school painter, probably the leader of the Barbizon school, um, who's known to have uh, repainted actually the sky of, of, of uh, the sky of this painting, the village of Bekinyi, in the early 1860s uh, under the influence of Japanese prints. And then another um, a Barbizon school artist, uh, Jean-François Millet, or Millet, uh, who was also fascinated by Japanese prints, um, their compositional strategies, uh, their bright, flat colors, uh, their high horizons, 
Um, and this work here by, by Millet uh, in the Auvergne from the late 60s, I think, um, with its high horizon line, uh, taps into that interest in, in Japanese prints. Um, other younger artists from the Impressionist generation, uh, as we know, just a little bit more context uh, before I speak more about Van Gogh, uh, also produce work uh, relating to the Vogue for Japanese. This is James Tiso, um, close friend of Duga, uh, young women uh, looking at Japanese objects. And this is a, a famous work by Mornay um, uh, showing his wife Camille, who's dressed in a kimono and, um, and sort of with a background of fan, she's holding a fan. This was shown at the Second Impressionist Exhibition in uh, 1876. Um, but I want to argue here that, um, that actually no other avant-garde artist of the mid to late 19th century engaged with Japanese art in as profound and wholehearted a way as uh, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, Van Gogh first mentions Japanese art in his letters when he was in Antwerp uh, in Belgium uh, in November 1885, uh, noting that he had hung a Japanese prince in his room at that time uh, and read the work of the Goncourt brothers who were celebrating Japanese art uh, in, their, in their books um, uh, you know, in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, Van Gogh then came to Paris in 1886 and became a regular visitor uh, to the gallery of uh, the noted art dealer uh, Siegfried Bing, um, who's uh, represented here in a kimono. Um, Bing was uh, one of the most prominent figures in, in terms of the art market in promoting Japanese art uh, in, in Paris in, in the 1880s. Uh, this is his, his gallery, which is, as you can see, is decorated in a kind of Japanese uh, style. And uh, Van Gogh himself actually organized uh, an exhibition of Japanese prints um, uh, soon after he arrived in Paris. He was in Paris from 86 to 88, uh, but in, in 1887, he, he organized a show uh, of Japanese prints and, and paintings at the cafe belonging to this woman, uh, Agostina Segatori. Uh, she was an Italian, uh, owned a, a cafe called Le Temperin. Um, and you can see uh, in the background of this image uh, one of the uh, paintings that was in the, the exhibition. This is a, probably a Japanese scroll painting. And then perhaps most notably, uh, when uh, Van Gogh was in Paris, um, he began to develop a collection of Japanese prints uh, with his, his brother, Theo. And the Van Gogh Museum now actually has a collection of 474 prints, uh, which were inherited from Vincent and Theo. Um, some were added by Theo's son, but the majority uh, did come from uh, Vincent and Theo, and it's generally agreed that the two brothers had around 400 uh, prints uh, in their collection. Uh, in 1887, uh, Van Gogh produced three uh, painted copies after his Japanese prints, uh, three of the prints uh, in his uh, collection. And this one, um, as we know, uh, the, the Hiroshige, Hiroshige print on the right is, is uh, in the, the exhibition. Um, and uh, you can see the Van Gogh a copy on the left. And uh, you can see the, I mean, the, this is a, the, the motif with the figures uh, crossing the bridge and protecting themselves with umbrellas. I think this is a, a figure actually with a straw raincoat, uh, and then a, a figure here sort of poling down the river. Um, and Van Gogh's um, you know, copy is, is pretty, you know, it's pretty close to the original, but he does um, really intensify the color. That's something very characteristic of his, his copies, as well as adding these, um, uh, inscriptions around the edge. Uh, the borders, I'll talk a little bit more in the context of the other copies uh, that he produces. And uh, then this is the second copy uh, that he produces in Paris after the, uh, the, the Aizen uh, courtesan um, print, which is also uh, in the exhibition. Um, so this is Van Gogh's copy. The copy wasn't actually made after the, uh, after the print itself but instead after a, a reproduction of the print which was on the cover of a magazine called Paris Illustré. Um, so this is uh, um, the magazine cover from 1886. Uh, Van Gogh made a tracing of it. Uh, he traced the cover, uh, added a grid, uh, and then actually enlarged uh, the, the original uh, print. So this, um, this image here is considerably uh, larger uh, than the, the original uh, cover. And you can see, you know, interestingly, he's added this, this border, and um, so you can see the bamboo uh, along the edge here. There's a cute little frog uh, in the foreground here. Um, there's a couple in a boat up here, um, water lilies here, and then a couple of cranes here, which are actually exerted from uh, other Japanese prints. But 
He included these, um, the frog and the crane, for a, a particular reason, because in French uh, slang, both of these elements actually reference prostitution. Um, and he was, you know, tapping into the history of, of the courtesan as, uh, as, you know, referencing that, that history of prostitution uh, in, in Japan. And then this is uh, the third, um, uh, the third copy that he produced. And again, this is, this is great that all these, all these prints were in this exhibition. So this is a uh, Hirak Shige uh, print, the plum tree uh, tea house at Kamedo. And again, you know, he made a tracing of this, um, of this print, um, added the grid uh, around the tracing and, and enlarged it. Uh, you can see in, in this work, you know, I think he was interested in the, in the kind of disjunction between near and far. Uh, the way in the original print you have this, you know, this wonderful kind of silhouette of this gnarled uh, plum tree, uh, flowering plum tree, and then in the distance, uh, uh, this group of figures uh, who are congregating uh, around the tea house and um, you know, enjoying the, uh, the blossom of, of the plum trees. Um, so that, this, this kind of play between near and far is something that you know, Van Gogh uh, really taps into uh, in, his own, uh, in his own painting. And again, you can see the intensif intensification of the color uh, in, in, his, uh, in his print and the addition of, of elements uh, around the border. Uh, this idea of, of, of um, you know, playing with near and far does continue into, into several of his images in, in the late 1880s. This is a, a famous uh, work um, called The Sower. And you can see the same idea with the silhouetted tree in the foreground, and then this is a, a church uh, in the distance. And then Van Gogh also painted a portrait of his, his dealer, uh, Pierre Tanguy, uh, surrounded by prints, which actually belonged to uh, Van Gogh. Um, Tanguy is a fascinating figure. He was, uh, you know, Van, Van Gogh didn't have many uh, dealers in Paris in the 1880s, but, but Tanguy was extremely supportive uh, of, of him and um, you know, regularly showed Van Gogh's work in his gallery. Tongi was a socialist utopian. He'd been part of the Paris Commune in 1871, that sort of fascinating moment in, in French um, history is often sort of overlooked. Uh, but he'd been sent, in, sent into exile uh, in the wake of the Commune, but had returned to France uh, in uh, 1873. And you know, Tongi's sympathy for the, the common man, I think, is, is suggested in the way that Van Gogh dresses him here with this um, sort of working men's, uh, man's jacket in particular. And I think that Van Gogh associated, associated Tongi's idealism uh, with Japan uh, and the idealism of, of Japanese artists in contrast to the kind of competitive urban environment uh, which you know, he experienced in Paris. So, um, he represents Tongi here against a range of Japanese prints, and they really kind of sum up uh, the artist's uh, or Van Gogh's attitude to uh, Japan. You see a range of landscape. You can see Mount Fuji up here and a, uh, a number of uh, two geishas here. This is actually the courtesan uh, painting. This is probably Van Gogh's own copy, which I just showed you. The others are actually Japanese prints, I think. Um, and I, you, know, you can actually um, identify the, the print, so that's what, um, that's what I'll try and do now. Um, this is, uh, um, you know, two of the prints. This is a Hiroshige um, cherry tree, which you can see up here. Uh, these are two figures who are planting rice in the fields. Um, and this one here is, um, uh, this is a print of the, the courtesan Takao, um, of the Murai, if I can say it, um, with irises behind her, which is, is reproduced here. And then these two are slightly more speculative, but the, uh, the view of Mount Fiji here may be derived from this, uh, this print by Hiroshige, where you can see the similar kind of reeds um, in, in, the, in the foreground, which you see to, to either side. I mean, there's some kind of artistic license here, I think. And then to this side, uh, you have the morning glories, which uh, uh, are derived, I think, from this uh, Japanese print to the right. And then the last one was kind of the, most, the hardest one to track down. Uh, but this, this view of snow here is, again, it's not a direct um, you know, reproduction of a print, but it probably derives from this, again, a Hiroshige print, um, a snow scene. So what, what you're seeing here is you know, actually Van Gogh uh, representing the four seasons. You have the, you know, the, the cherry blossom, which is spring, and the morning glory, which is summer, um, 
uh, Mount Fuji here, which is autumn, and then the snow uh, scene here, which is winter. So representing the range of the seasons, which you know, Japanese print artists were, were representing, and really kind of summing up in one image with the geisha, the geisha also the, the sort of principal themes uh, within uh, Japanese uh, print uh, imagery. Oh, I don't know why I put this one in, but this is, a, uh, this is a, again, you know, to try and liven things up a bit, have it include a caricature, and, and this is actually the, um, a, a caricature based on Pierre Tongi, and, and Van Gogh is presenting um, uh, his Pierre Tongi painting to a, a, a Parisian dealer and, um, you know, talking about Japanese influences, impressionism and pointillism, um, asking for his, the dealer's opinion of his work, and... Uh, the dealer has been extremely complimentary, as you can see, um, saying that you paint like a lunatic. So, um, you know, kind of tapping into that mythology again of, of Van Gogh as being a sort of crazy outsider figure. But in fact, we know, you know, he, he, you know his, his mental problems were particularly epileptic. And, you know, there were particular moments where, particular periods where, you know, he, he wasn't painting. But for the periods when he was painting and when he was drawing, he was actually very lucid and methodical in his methods. I mean, just look at the tracings that I've just been showing you, for example. Um, so, a really crucial uh, period in, in Van Gogh's uh, career in terms of understanding his, his relationship to Japan is, is his, his time in Arles, uh, in the south of France. He was in Arles uh, for around a year, uh, between 1888 uh, and 1889. Arles, as you, as you know, is a, an ancient Roman city. Um, and Van Gogh was, um, I think he was becoming increasingly disillusioned with the world of Paris and the uh, um, and the sort of cutthroat, uh, sort of capitalistic environment which he was uh, experiencing there. And he decided to move uh, to the south of France in uh, February uh, 1888. Um, and, you know, through the reading of, of, of various uh, writers, the Goncourt brothers, Philippe Bialti, uh, visits to Siegfried Bing's gallery, he really developed this vision of, of uh, the south of France as akin to Japan. Um, as a place of, of light and luminosity, uh, which he associated with uh, Japan. Uh, when he arrived in, in February 1888, uh, he, he actually encountered snow. He didn't encounter the sort of bright light and, um, and sun that he'd been uh, expecting, but he immediately compared what he saw to a uh, Japanese print. And it's fascinating to read his letters from this time. Um, very few letters by uh, Van, Van Gogh survived from his time in Paris. Um, but, you know, once he gets down to Arles, he's writing back to Theo in Paris, you see a really voluminous uh, correspondence, and his letters are full of references to Paris, uh, to, to Japan, rather. Um, around 100, 100 letters uh, refer to, to Japan uh, over the period of his career, and, and most of those uh, are, are written uh, during the Arles uh, period. He talks about how he finds, quote, equivalents, uh, unquote, to Japan uh, in the South. Um, his letters are great. I mean, I'm just going to quote one here. The weather here remains fine, and if it was always like this, it, it would be better than a painter's paradise. It would be absolute Japan. Uh, and this is a, a painting from soon after he arrived uh, in Arles um, with the kind of high viewpoint, uh, the con contorted tree form, uh, the very kind of... Um, it's a very sort of Japanese defect, uh, you know, the, uh, the way that, uh, you know, the scene is, is, is represented uh, here. And then this uh, painting was um, produced a couple of months after he'd arrived in Arles. Um, and again, you know, his, his correspondence specifically talks about uh, this, uh, this work. He describes it as, quote, uh, this is a view of Arles, a little town uh, surrounded by fields, all covered with yellow and purple flowers exactly. Can't you see it? Like a Japanese dream. Now, several of his works from this time focus on landscape uh, and nature. And I love this, he wrote of his time in Provence, um, and I, I, again, this is a quote from his letters, um, here I'll have more and more the existence of a Japanese painter living close to nature. So I think it's a key point that he appreciated Japanese art on a formal level. You can see the, the bright, uh, the flat color, the bright color, uh, which is, is characteristic of his work at this time, and I think it is influenced by uh, Japanese prints. You can see the high horizons, um, you know, in several of his paintings from, his t from this time, the dramatic cropping effects, uh, which are very char characteristic of Japanese prints. 
Um, so there's influence on a, on a formal level, but in a way, um, at least for me, sort of more interesting is, is the way that he engages with uh, Japanese art on a spiritual level, sort of metaphysical level. Um, he, he developed a profound attraction to what he perceived as the, the humility, the simplicity, uh, the closeness to nature of, of the Japanese way of life, uh, which he saw as a counterpoint to the corruption and decadence of what he found in, in Paris in particular, uh, the urban environment. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, this is a, another work that he produced you know, fairly soon uh, after arriving in, in Arles. Uh, and he talked about this as uh, being inspired by, by a sunset effect uh, that he'd seen um, uh, on the River Rhone. Uh, he compared it again to Japan. Quote, I saw a magnificent and strange effect this evening. A very big boat loaded with coal on the Rhone, moored to the quay. The sky lilac with an orange streak in the west. It was pure hokusai. So you can see, and he's seeing nature here through the lens of, of Japanese art. Now, interestingly, hokusai is the, is the one um, you know, Japanese artist you, you would have expected to be in, in Van Gogh's collection of Japanese prints who actually wasn't in his collection. And, and the reason was that by this point, hokusai was too expensive for Van Gogh. You know, hokusai was the best known uh, Japanese printmaker by the late 19th century. Um, and uh, you know, most of um, Van Gogh's prints are uh, actually lesser known uh, Japanese uh, printmakers. Hiroshige is the most, uh, most prominent uh, figure uh, within his, um, his collection. He noted proudly at one point that some of his prints would be worth, quote, as much as five francs, which is not a great deal. But, uh, um, so I've looked a little bit at, uh, at landscape, um, and I also want to talk a, uh, a little bit now about portraiture. Um, uh, portraiture was also central to, uh, uh, to Van Gogh's uh, output atal. Um, he produced about 25 um, portraits in particular of uh, the Rulan family. And it's so great that you have this, um, this, uh, this painting in, in the exhibition. I've just seen an exhibition at the Cleveland Museum of Art called Van Gogh Repetitions, which brings together a series of um, portraits of, of Joseph Roulin. Uh, there, was, there were six portraits that Van Gogh did of Roulin. They would have loved to have this painting in their exhibition, <laughs> so you did a good job getting it here. Um, but they, they do have four, four paintings of Joseph Roulin, but this is actually the first of the six, um, and it's the only one which is three-quarter three length. Um, so um, this, is a, this is a postman, jo Joseph Roulin. Uh, he was responsible for unloading mail uh, at the Arles uh, train station. He was one of uh, Van, Glo Van Gogh's closest friends and a, a drinking companion uh, for uh, Van Gogh. Um, Van Gogh, I keep saying Van Gogh, it's bizarre for me to say Van Gogh, I should say, because I'm from England, and we all say Van Gogh out there, or Van, Van Hock, but I've become Americanized. I say Van Gogh now, but um, anyway. Um, uh, Van Gogh uh, first mentions Roulin on, on the 31st of July, 1888, uh, and he says about him, uh, quote, the man is a fervent Republican and socialist, reasons very well and knows many things. And then Van Gogh went on to describe his, his uh, three-quarter length portrait of Roulin sitting in a chair, uh, the work which is in, in your exhibition, um, and he says, I'm now working on the portrait of a postman with his dark blue uniform with yellow a head something like that of Socrates, almost no nose, a high forehead, bald pate, that's probably why he wore a hat, oh, well, it's for his job as well, but anyway, um, small gray eyes, high colored, full cheeks, and big beard, pepper and salt, big ears. His wife gave birth today, and so he's really in fine feather and glowing with satisfaction. So that this, you know, this is a background to the, the painting uh, in your exhibition. And um, you know, it's interesting just to look at it, the way it is, is painted. It's very thinly painted in, in the background. Um, it's interesting to see the pentimenti here. here. You can see the way that he's, he's changed the, the line of the sleeve of, um, of Roulin. I haven't really realized that until I actually looked at the painting. You can see that he, originally the sleeve was wider. He like, you know, took it in a little bit, and also the hat. He slightly changed the, the line of the hats. Um, the hands are fascinating because you know, the, the right hand is pretty sketchily painted, but the left hand is a little bit more developed, and you see these, um, you know, the outlining in red, uh, or the fingers here, which you don't see on, on the right hand. 
And then the beard and the, and the face itself is, is fascinating, the way that Van Gogh is playing with, with uh, you know, the, the, the complementary is, uh, um, you know, the nostrils have touches of red in them and then the yellow in the beard and then the blue in the, uh, in, in, in the hat, you know, the way he plays those, those red, yellows and blues off, off against uh, each other, I think is really fascinating. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's interesting to see the, uh, the actor portraits, um, the Japanese actor portraits in the show, and this is, uh, you know, I put this one in a three-quarter length portrait, which you can argue um, uh, may have, uh, have influenced Van Gogh. And then, um, you know, an interesting thing, which is discussed a little bit in that repetition show, is that Van Gogh did produce these drawings after the, after the painting, and uh, two variant drawings. This is one which he actually sent to his, his um, uh, painter colleague, Emile Bernard. Um, you know, it's, again, it's sort of, again, complicating this idea of Van Gogh as a, as a sort of, um, you know, sort of tormented outsider figure. He was quite calculating in his methods, the way he did produce repetitions. So you know, he'll produce these repetitions to send to his artist friends in, in, in the hope of, you know, developing collaborations with them. Um, and this is uh, the second uh, rep drawing repetition, um, where if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see the difference. Can you see the difference in this one compared to that one? No. Nope. So he adds this. Um, he adds the glass on the on, on the right, and you know I don't know why he did that exactly, but it, uh, Roulin had had this this reputation as a hard drinker, so there may have been a a, a reference to uh, to that. Um, and then he also produced five other uh, views of of Roulin. Um, and these are all, you know, close-up uh, bust uh, views, and they're, they're fascinating. This one was produced at the same time as the work in the exhibition, um, and he was getting frustrated with Roulin's kind of um, pose, which he felt was too static, so he, he painted this work uh, very quickly. And then an, another, um, another drawing, and this is a fascinating one. I mean, this is uh, so abstract, and, you know, this is, is painted at the same time uh, that, that, so he was working with Gauguin uh, in, uh, uh, in, in our, um, you know, Gauguin came to, came to visit uh, Van Gogh for two months between October and December uh, 1888, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, you know, the, the, you know what actually happened with, uh, ultimately with that, um, with that visit, but uh, uh, this is a, you know, this is Van Gogh being, in some ways being far more abstract than what we've seen before with this very flat background, which you could argue is Japanese. Uh, and the, the ear here is, is great, it's just this line of red, um, but it's, it's very flat and, and very uh, abstract, this, this painting, and perhaps was, you know, produced under the influence of Gauguin. And, you know, you can argue that the relationship to Japanese uh, prints here. Uh, this is uh, uh, the next one, this is at the Barnes Collection. And, you know, by now, uh, Van Gogh is producing uh, these, um, these Roulin portraits with this very decorative uh, wallpaper background of, uh, of dahlias. This is actually, a, you know, rarely that he actually, you know, he doesn't generally sign his work, but uh, in this case he does. Uh, and then these, t these last two, um, I think it's interesting to see the progression because, I mean, the way he treats a beard, for example, becomes increasingly decorative. Uh, and you can see the sort of play of line, the swirling lines um, that are less evident in the earlier, uh, in the earlier portraits. Um, you know, another thing to think about in Van Gogh's work is that his paintings change uh, with time, and we know that this uh, painting originally, these little dots of, of color here, they were once red and pink, but they've changed with time, they've faded, and they've, they've actually turned to white. The Van Gogh Museum has done a lot of work on, on, on this, uh, these kind of transformations. And I include this, uh, you know, the famous Starry Night, because the way that the uh, the way that the, um, the sky is represented here, I think you can compare to the, to the beard uh, in these uh, images here. Um, another one of my caricatures. So, um, so this is a starry, starry night, and, um, and uh, um, so less than Prozac period, sunny, sunny day, and again, you know, the reference to uh, Van Gogh's uh, mood swings, or perceived mood swings. Um, this one is interesting. This is uh, La Mousme. There should be an accent there. Um, and this is uh, a portrait, I think, directly related to Japanese culture. It was, it was, um, it was produced around the same time as, uh, as the Roulin portraits we were just looking at. 
Uh, and musume, uh, the word musume, as he noted, was a Japanese uh, word, as Vengo noted, was a Japanese word for a young girl. And he noted in his letters that uh, she would have been 12 to 14 uh, years old. And here he's painted a Provencal girl, uh, but represented her as a, as a kind of Japanese. Um, and he talks about the musume idea as, as referencing particularly the idea of pouting, uh, mu in, in French. So you can see she does have a slight, uh, a slight pout. Uh, and the word was, was actually much used by the French writer Pierre Lotti uh, in his um, book Madame Chrysanthème. So, and that was interesting to see that in the, in the um, exhibition, the, um, the, the kimono um, you know, with the, the chrysanthemum pattern. Um, you know, this, the Madame Chrysanthème, Chrysanthème was a book which Van Gogh read and repeatedly quoted in his letters. And you know, it's this fascinating history of, of a Western naval officer and a Japanese geisha. Um, and as, as we know, became the model for, uh, for Madame Butterfly. Um, and then, you know, some of Van Gogh's drawings. Uh, Van Gogh, incredibly prolific draftsman, um, and his style of drawing is certainly influenced by Japanese art um, and, and the Japanese method of, of drawing. Um, his kind of formal language of, of squiggles and, um, you know, varying lines and, and dots in the sky. I mean, this is a, exactly the kind of thing that you find in, in the Japanese drawing of, uh, of artists like Hokusai. And this is another one. Um, I'll show you a dra drawing by Hokusai in a second, but this is, uh, um, this is a work which, you know, Van Gogh was proud of, and he thought, he, I think he said, you know, this is my most Japanese work to date. And it's a view of uh, the La Croix from Mont Majeur. Um, and you can see, again, these little dots in the, uh, in, in the drawing. Uh, the high horizon, which is very Japanese. Um, you can see the, the train um, crossing the, the plane here, the carriage here, sort of interesting mix of the modern and the, and the less modern. And then interestingly, if you look carefully at the bottom here, the, the cartouche which he's included, um, which describes uh, you know, the, the, the subject, the title of the painting, I think that's, you know, that's derived from Japanese prints. It's exactly the same kind of cartouche that you see in the Hiroshige. Um, Prince or the other uh, Japanese um, uh, artists in, in the exhibition. And then this is a, um, a detail of a Hokusai um, print where you can see that similar um, sort of use of, of, of dotted uh, work uh, that we find in the, in the, uh, in the Van Gogh uh, drawings. Um, so uh, at the same time that, uh, uh, that Van Gogh was producing these drawings, he, um, I think he really aimed to create what he called a studio of the South, a studio of the South, a collaborative community of artists uh, working together in harmony on the model of a Japanese monastery. Um, he envisaged a life together at the Yellow House in Arles with his fellow painters, uh, Paul Gauguin and uh, Emile uh, Bernard. Um, and he encouraged the exchange of portraits um, uh, with uh, Gauguin and Bernard to cement their bond. And it, this, this he saw as being a model which Japanese artists had actually, um, had actually created. Um, he talked about Japanese artists as exchanging work uh, between themselves. Um, this is the yellow house where, where Van Gogh lived and where um, uh, Gauguin lived with him for uh, uh, those two months in, in, in the late uh, uh, period of 1888. Uh, so these are the two portraits which uh, Gauguin and Bernard are sent to, uh, to Van Gogh. Um, and this is Gauguin's on the left. Um, this is a portrait of Bernard actually at the back. And if you look carefully here, you can see this inscription. Um, it says, Les Miserables, uh, L'Ami Vincent, uh, P. Gauguin, uh, 1888. And this is, um, this, is, this is actually Gauguin sort of cultivating his sort of outsider mentality and uh, sort of referencing the, the, the difficulties and troubles he'd ha he's had and um, referencing speci specifically the Victor Hugo and uh, Novel Miserable here. And, and in a letter when he talks about uh, this painting, he, he actually describes himself as Jean Valjean, who was a protagonist of, uh, of Les Miserables. And then this is Bernard. This is his uh, portrait, which was sent to, um, to, to Van Gogh. So you can see uh, Bernard's signature to Asson Copain, uh, Vincent to his friend Vincent. This is Gauguin uh, in the background. And, and here there's a reference of uh, you know, Bernard's interest in Japanese prints, because there's a, <coughs> a Japanese print at the bottom right here. And then this is uh, the image I started with, you know, the one where I talked about uh, Van Gogh describing himself uh, as 
um, you know, quote, worshipping the eternal Buddha, the way he was, I think, trying to engage with the, the more sort of metaphysical uh, aspects of, of Japanese culture. Um, it's almost as if he's kind of effacing his Dutch identity here uh, to become uh, Japanese. Um, if you look carefully, there's a sort of aureole uh, around the, the, the head of uh, Van Gogh, which is almost like the sort of aureole that you, felt, you find around the Bodhisattva. And then if you look even more carefully, you can see that there's an inscription up the top here. <clears throat> this was originally inscribed to Paul Gauguin. This was Van Gogh's own inscription to uh, Paul Gauguin. Um, let's bear that in mind because I'll come back to that. Um, but Van Gogh's... Um, painting was, it was based on, on the shaved heads of, of Japanese monks, um, which he'd seen uh, in, the, um, in the illustrated uh, book of Pierre, uh, of Pierre Lotti's Madame Chrysanthème. So you can see here these, these Japanese monks here, which I think in, inspired Van Gogh to, to shave his own head. And, and even their, their, their costume here with the V-neck is, is something that I think uh, influences uh, Van Gogh's uh, costume here. Um, now, Gauguin had, had arrived in Arles uh, in October 1888. Uh, he spent two months there, and uh, you know, there, was, there was an intense collaboration between the two artists, but um, as is well known, it led to a, a, you know, a celebrated fight between them when, when Van Gogh pulled a razor on uh, Gauguin, um, and uh, uh, Gauguin went back to Paris pretty quickly, um, and Van Gogh cut off his ear. Um, and uh, in the wake of that, you know, what, is, what we generally think is that uh, Van Gogh scrubbed out the, um, the, the inscription that he made to, to Gauguin. You know, that, that falling out with, that dramatic falling out with Gauguin kind of signaled the end of his, the, this great idealism he'd, he'd had for the creation of a community uh, of artists at all, that community of artists based on the Japanese model. Um, and then, you know, in, in the wake of, um, of cutting off his ear, he produced this portrait uh, with a bandaged ear in, ja in January, 1880, <coughs> January 1889. Um, this is a work in, in the Courtauld uh, collection. Um, so um, the idea of Van Gogh uh, cutting off his ear, which was a, an incredibly uh, traumatic uh, time for him, has become the subject of much uh, popular culture. Um, so uh, to digress in some ways here, um, the ways in which his, his story has been appropriated for uh, popular culture, here is a, a bandaged uh, action figure of, of Vincent Van Gogh. I like this one. Um, this is a Van Gogh, a recurring problem in later years with his um, unable to keep his glasses on. And then my favorite, I, probably my favorite is this one, um, the disappearing Vincent Van Gogh mug where um, you put your hot beverage in the mug and, and, and Van Gogh's ear disappears. I'm sure Van Gogh would have loved that. Anyway. Um, so, um, for our purposes, um, what, what, we can, um, what we can see, if you look carefully, in, in the background of, of this portrait is, uh, is a Japanese print, so, um, and we can identify the print. Uh, so this is it's a print on the right where you can see the geisha, um, you can see Mount Fuji in the background, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty accurately represented by Van Gogh. There's some playing around with uh, the placing of the figures. And, and actually, uh, do you remember I said that in the in the, um, the copy after the Essen um, uh, portrait of the courtesan that he'd added two cranes in the border. Do you remember that? Well, th those two cranes were actually exerted from this print here. Um, now, after the episode of, of Van Gogh cutting off his, his ear and the rupture with uh, Gauguin, uh, Van Gogh uh, rarely actually refers to, to, Japan, <coughs> to Japan or Japanese art in his letters. Really the high point of, um, of the references to Japan is, is the Al period. And in the early uh, months of 1889, he, he, um, you know, he moves to Saint-Rémy and, and spends time in, in, in the asylum uh, at, uh, at Saint-Rémy. Um, but the influence of Japanese art continues, uh, particularly in his focus on, on close-up uh, details. And I think his attraction to the way that uh, Japanese artists focused on particular elements in nature um, 
it was, uh, it was influenced by, you know, by his reading and particularly by uh, the kind of images that he saw in, in Siegfried Bing's um, uh, publication, Le, Le Japon Artistique, uh, Artistic Japan. And this is uh, the cover illustration and title page of uh, Le Japon Artistique with the reference to Bing, who we saw, if you remember at the beginning in that, in that photograph of him, he was a prominent you know, dealer in, in Japanese, more in Japanese. Uh, Japanese prints, but also produced publications to promote uh, Japanese, uh, and this was the most prominent uh, of uh, of those. Uh, and this, you know, this publication had had these great images, and you know, this is is from the opening um, publication in May 1888, with these great details. This is a study of pinks. Uh, this is a study of grasses, um, and these are the. You know, we know that Van Gogh read this uh, read this publication, and I think they really informed his work. Um, and there, I, I, I'm going to, this is quite a long quote, but it's, it's worth, it is worth quoting because I think it's quite, um, it's quite insightful in, in terms of his understanding of, of Japanese art. Um, he, he said, this is in, in, in 1888, if we study Japanese art, then we see an undoubtedly, then we see an undoubtedly wise and philosophic and intelligent man. He studies a single blade of grass. But this blade of grass leads him to draw all the plants, then the seasons, then broad features of landscapes, finally animals, and then the human figure. Isn't it almost a new religion that these Japanese teach us, who are so simple and live in nature as if they themselves were flowers? So I think he loved the way that, you know, in Japanese art, there was this really fo you know, close focus on the detail uh, and the particular, you know, particular elements uh, within uh, the landscape, and I think that that, uh, you know, that aesthetic informs his late focus on on close-up details in his own painting. Um, you know, a wonderful group of works that he produced at Saint Remy uh, in in the you know in the final uh, year, well, the final February 18, 1889 to May 1890 uh, Saint Remy. Um, this is a you know, the Getty painting irises, where you can see that, that sort of close-up element that I think he did take from Japanese prints. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, painting, Emperor Moth. And this is a, you know, this is a famous painting, Almond Tree and Blossom. Uh, this is actually, um, uh, this has an interesting history because it was produced at the time of, of the birth of his nephew, uh, Vincent Wilhelm, um, so that the son of his, his brother, Theo. Uh, and Van Gogh sent it to, uh, sent it to Paris, uh, to uh, Theo, uh, where the proud parents um, actually hung the, uh, hung the work in, in the bedroom of, of their newborn child. But I think, I mean, this, this work pretty evidently, you know, draws on, on Japanese prints. And then, you know, this, this, um, this final work, which was produced when he was in Orvea, uh, this is called Roots and Tree Trunks. Um, and this is often said to be uh, Van Gogh's uh, final painting. There's some debate over that as to which was the final work. But this, um, now that the, you know, the debate is, is going in this direction, and again, this is sort of close up, you know, focus on particular elements uh, within uh, the landscape. So we can literally say, I think, that, you know, the Japanese uh, aesthetic uh, remained uh, with uh, Van Gogh until the end of his life. Um, so this, this is the image with which I started the lecture, which I think embodies uh, the artist's vision uh, in his words of, of quote, uh, a Japanese uh, painter uh, or a Japanese painter living close to nature, unquote. Um, so just as a coda, um, I'm going to show this image. Um, so in the wake of his death, uh, Van Gogh's um, influence, you know, has continued. He has, a, of course, has a great impact in Japan. His work has, has been much bought in Japan by Japanese collectors um, and exhibited in Japanese museums. Um, what you see here is actually the banner for a 2013 uh, Van Gogh exhibition in a Paris show at, at, at Hiroshima. And in China and Japan, you see these factories where of people actually producing large numbers of hand-painted reproductions of uh, Van Gogh paintings. Uh, it's more so in China, actually, but it does overlap to Japan. And this is one of the, the shops in, in which uh, you know, these paintings are sold. So this is, is based on the, the red uh, vineyard. This is actually the only, used to be thought that this was the only painting that Van Gogh ever sold. Uh, it's in the Pushkin Museum. This is a copy after it. This is a famous uh, Van Gogh uh, sunflowers. So Van Gogh's influence remains uh, very strong until this day uh, in Japan. So thank you. Are, are there any questions?
Happy to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that slide doesn't do justice to it. Uh, it's speak to my assistant. Yeah. Absolutely yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Well, that, that was better than the one we had before. Yeah, so. it's just, I mean, it, it can't, you can't imagine it until you see it. Yeah. Really real, just the power of that painting. But I, in just bringing up the whole thing, I think you kind of t even took the Japanese. Yeah. Tradition of looking at the simple plants to even its next level of like showing the dandelion and all the really humble simple plants in all this like you were saying this um, immense detail. Yeah. Real close up and just a really fascinating. I think I mean I think that's that's a great point and you know I think it is it is fascinating that you know, that level of detail. You know what it makes me think of as well is, is Blake, you know, seeing the world in a grain of sand. You know, that idea of just really, you know, seeing so much and so little. Um, but, uh, you know, to me it, it is, you know, I, I, I love the, the formal aspects, the way that, you know, Van Gogh does, does crop his forms and, the, you know, the, the flattening of, of, of form, the, the, the coloristic um, influence but but I think and that I think in you know that that is probably what separates him from Monet to me that he engages with uh, Japanese art on a more kind of spiritual metaphysical level than Monet does at least that's what I think I mean I've, I've done quite a bit of work on Monet and Monet did, did have a big collection of Japanese prints but but you don't get that that sense of kind of intensity the way that he engaged with Japan that, that, that Van Gogh uh, had and I think you know it taps into Van Gogh's background. You know he had this this spiritual background. His father was a pastor. You know he himself spent several years as a preacher. Um, and you read it and you, when you read his letters. You know they have this very strong you know metaphysical you know content to them, which you don't generally find in Monet's uh, in Monet's letters. So he gave that sort of gloss to the way that he he looked at Japanese art. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, can you hear the questions? Did you hear the question? Um, so the question was, you know, what, why, does, why does Van Gogh kind of simplify his backgrounds? And uh, is that right? Sort of not, it doesn't have much detail in the background. That's basically he's what you're saying. Detail. Yeah. One, he's great at detail. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I, I, you know, we, I could look at some examples, but I think it, 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 it may be, get, you know, getting back to the Japanese influence. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, what, what you see in a lot of Japanese prints are, you know, are those, are, are, the lack of detail in the background, sort of flat backgrounds, and the kind of thing that you see in the Hiroshige, you know, print of the plum tree at Kameda, where you see that, that contrast between, between foreground and background and that real kind of disjunction of near and far. I mean, I think he was interested in that kind of spatial disjunction, and you could argue that that's enhanced by keeping the background really simple. And you see that in, in, the, you know, in the Van Gogh that you have in, in, in your exhibition, that you know, the background is very simple, and it has this kind of sort of pat, patchwork. But it makes the figure really pop, exactly. And I, mean, I could have shown other, you know, there's a great painting in, in the Metropolitan La Lisienne, you know, which uh, has this kind of bright lemon yellow background, which is just, it's just lemon yellow. And it's like the, I mean, that's a beautiful painting from the Vintertour collection of, of Roulin with the, the yellow background that I showed. Just really simple, but it really makes, uh, you know, makes the, um, um, you know, make, make, makes the subject pop. And, you know, one of the differences between Van Gogh and, and Gauguin is that, um, you know, I think you can say that while Gauguin was genuinely moving towards abstraction, uh, Van Gogh's work is always grounded in nature, I would say, but, but in those works, that's the closest he gets to abstraction, that moment when he is working with Gauguin.
Yeah. Well, yeah, start, start back with another issue because, you know, in his, um, you know, Van Gogh has this moment in, in 1889 where he, he starts to explore what he calls style. Um, so, you know, Theo is, is always urging him to, you know, to, to produce more naturalistic work because that sells better. He thinks it will sell better. But Van Gogh's trying to push himself, go in new directions. So he's developing this, you know, much more decorative style. So that's, you know, you see all the, you know, the curling patterns in the sky. Uh, Taylor didn't want him to do that. You know, Taylor's like, "Why are you doing this? This is this is bad." Um, and uh, so Van Gogh does continue that for a, you know a brief moment, but actually he goes back to a greater sense of naturalism. You know, in the late you know late period of 1889. Um, so it's interesting that actually that back and forth between Vincent and Taylor is fascinating. You know, because Taylor is trying to make make him produce work which will sell better. So. Oh, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, and that actually, that's, that's one of the great things about the exhibition is, is the sort of range of media that you have in it. I think I said that at the beginning, to see the kimonos, and, and I, think, um, I think that's a good point. I think he was. You know, I think, I think he was, you know, um, he wasn't just looking at prints. I'm sure, you know, he would have, you know, seen the, that kind of, you know, the kind of costumes that you have in the exhibition. He would have seen that Bing's, you know, or, or would have seen, you know, the, the, at the World's Fair when, you know, when, when you know, he would have seen women dressed up as in kimonos or whatever. So, so I think that's, a, that's certainly a um, you know, valid comparison. Was the, was the Buddhist religion much in evidence in, in uh, It's a good question. I mean, you do, um, I don't know all the details of that, but what I can say is that, um, you know, generally you don't, don't find much interest in it um, in, you know, in, the, in the middle to the, you know, sort of when positivism is, is, is a sort of dominant paradigm with people like Renan and, and Auguste Comte, you don't see so much interest. But in, in the later part of the 19th century, with the rise of symbolism um, and, and a greater interest in comparative religion, I, I do think you start to see more interest in, in, in Buddhism. And, uh, and several of the artists who were, you know, working um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the symbolist mode were... Uh, we're looking to Buddhism. Probably the best example is Audran Rodin. Uh, Audran Rodin, and he, you know, he, he does some great paintings which actually, you know, depict the Buddha, uh, and uh, you know, could be a good comparison for uh, for Van Gogh. Um, so I think that, yeah, that, at the end of the century, there is more interest in Buddhism. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, there was a pear tree. You know, this is a, this is one of a whole series that he did of, of orchards um, uh, in the south of France. There are various other views of apple orchards. Um, so, you know, it's grounded in nature. There is an essential naturalism to that image. But uh, you know, he sees nature through the lens of Japanese art. I think that's the way to look at it. Um, so, you know, you, you can look at the way that he pictures uh, um, the, the pear, uh, the pear blossom. The pear tree is, is being influenced by his knowledge of, of Japanese prints and the sort of flattening effect and the, um, the kind, of, kind of abstracting sort of you know, decorative effect that he creates is informed by exactly those kind of, effect, of effects that he saw in Japanese prints. Um, does that make sense? But he's, but he, well, he's not. I mean, it's not photographic, is it? I mean, it's not. You know, it's, so he's. I mean, but that's part of what you know. If he was doing, yeah, 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 
Yeah, but that's, you know, the whole history of, you know, avant-garde modernism is sort of, you know, from Manet through to Jackson Pollock or whatever. It's, it's a whole story of getting away from photographic naturalism. That's, uh, that's a story of, you know, avant-garde, um, you know, avant-garde painting and, and uh, you know, experimenting with uh, the paint surface ultimately as, as a two-dimensional, you know, surface which becomes abstract. Um, and moving away from the idea of, of a painting as being like a three-dimensional window through space. Uh, and Van Gogh is still on, is on the cusp with that, that, that sort of change towards abstraction, because as I said, I, I do think that his work is grounded in nature, but there's certainly an interest in intensified color, uh, flattening effects, movement. movement, other things too I'm forgetting, I'm sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't know what you were before you talked, but you did have the nuanced understanding of the market. Yeah. And all these other things. Yeah. Failed so efficiently, in spite of that, from a sales standpoint. Yeah. You touched on a minute ago that his brother was pushing that he needed to perhaps look at things or approach things more naturalistically, more photographically, however you want to put it. Do you think he was just sort of ahead in the curve with respect to that? Um, I mean, in a way, he, you know, he, he's, um, um, I mean, the relationship between the artist and the market is always an interesting one, and, and, and Van Gogh had a very strong sense of his own identity, uh, and I don't think wanted to adapt necessarily to the, you know, to, to what the market wanted. Um, but, you know, when I did that, I, you know, I did quite a bit of work, and he, he was involved with several dealers, and he did sell a few works, and and you know, in, in 18, and he was selling, uh, he was showing, um, you know, paintings in several exhibitions in, in Paris and in Belgium, and starting to get pretty good critical reviews. He got this wonderful, you know, quite a famous review by a critic called Albert Aurier uh, in, in early 1890, which was a glowing review. He was starting to get better known, and he just bought, had a painting uh, bought by a, a Belgian painter called uh, Anna Bock in for 400 francs, a red vineyard in, in early 1890. So, I think, you know, had he not um, committed suicide, he, you know, within two or three years he would have been enjoying actually some success. He was starting to become better known when he, you know, when he actually killed himself, so. Um. And, any other questions? Good questions, it's, it's great, so. Thank you. All right, thank you, yeah, thank you.